Good morning. Welcome to the Northwest Texas Online Missional United Methodist Church. Together with Jeff Fisher and Jamie Montgomery, we look forward to worshiping with you today. And we are so blessed to have Bishop Jimmy Nunn bringing our message again today. And I, I know that you will find it meaningful. So, we invite you to clear your minds of the demands of the outside world and enter into this time of opening ourselves to what God would say to us. If you would, please tell your friends and family about our church and invite them to join us in worship, discussion, and fellowship. Remember, you can view any of our services on demand by going to the online church on the conference website or directly to YouTube. Also, let us know you're watching by filling out a Connect card each week. You can find a link to that card on the Northwest Texas Conference website under the online church found in the top menu bar. And we also encourage you to keep us updated with your email so we can keep you updated on what is happening in our church and around the Northwest Texas Conference. Over the next few weeks, you will hear more about how we are looking to transition the online church to an even better, a better place and, and a better experience and reach more people for Christ. And, and please let us know of any needs or prayer requests on the Connect card. One final thing, an important part of worship is offering to God our tithes and offerings. Since we cannot pass the offering plate in our virtual church, we hope that you will consider making an offering to a transformational ministry in your area. If you need some ideas, please contact us. Another great option we would be to contribute to an advanced project through Global Ministries of the United Methodist Church. There are hundreds of options of life-changing work that is being done throughout the world, including support through the United Methodist Committee on Relief, UMCOR, for the communities of Perryton and Matador, recently hit by devastating tornadoes. You can find those ministries and make a donation by going to advance.umcmission.org. Advance.umcmission.org. Now, let us center ourselves as we enter into this time of worship. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for this day and, and this opportunity to come into your presence. We know that every blessing comes from you, that all we have is yours. So please guide us in sharing our blessings with others and being good stewards of your creation. We remember those who are in need of your healing touch. We lift up those who are grieving. We pray for those who feel there is no hope, no point, or no purpose to their lives. We know that you are with, all of, with us always. As you call us, may we be your presence, your comforting touch, your word of encouragement. And Father, we pray for our broken world, a world where might seems to make right and justice seems to be in short supply for many. May it break our hearts for what breaks your heart and may we be instruments of your peace this day and all days. Forgive us where we fail, where we have strayed from your path, guide us, direct us, and strengthen us to return to your ways. And as you have extended grace to us, May we expend your grace. May we extend your grace and love and mercy to others. Now, as we continue in an attitude of prayer, we offer the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
continue the thinking through the 18th chapter and 19th chapter of Luke this this morning. And um, I want to read again that text I did last week from the 18th chapter and the 14th verse. It's really the point of these uh, groups of stories. All who lift themselves up will be brought low, and those who make themselves low will be lifted up. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Last week I began talking about this, uh, this verse because it's such a theme verse in Luke 18 and 19. Um, it, uh, it really points out that our attitude, whether we are haughty and high-minded or humble uh, before the Lord, makes a difference in our spiritual lives. This week I want to move forward with uh, really three more stories that uh, may seem really unrelated on first uh, reading, but they're very tied together. The first one is this. We've heard the, the, uh, the, the verse a lot, but we just stop there, really. It's uh, verse 15 of chapter 18. People were bringing babies to Jesus so he would bless them. When the disciples saw this, they scolded them. Then Jesus said, allow the children to come to me. Do not forbid them because God's kingdom belongs to people like these children. We have taken that verse and, uh, and, and applied it, which certainly is a good thing to do. We want children to come to Jesus. Jesus wants children to come to Jesus. But sometimes the obvious point makes us miss a larger implication of that. The children are the ones who are, are brought low, really, in that initial verse. They are the ones who are lowly. People don't uh, give children sometimes the respect that they need. They are little people. They're human beings. And they de deserve our, our love and our devotion and our nurture and our care. And certainly we want to do that. Um, sadly, in the world today, there's so many children who've been abused and neglected. Uh, the foster system is overflowing. Um, our society is at a crisis, and it is a decades crisis now of, uh, of not nurturing our children or bringing them to Jesus. The word, though, in this text I want to focus on is this. The disciples scolded the parents for bringing their children to Jesus. That word scolded will appear again in these, uh, the, these stories. So when we get to it again, I'm going to emphasize it. But right now, just think about this. When people are bringing the innocent ones to Jesus, the children to Jesus, the response of the disciples was to the scold them for doing that. For every invitation that we have offered to follow Jesus, there also seems to be at least as many scoldings. And that's the case in these, these chapters. The next story jumps abruptly to the story of the rich young ruler. And that's probably one we're all familiar with as well. You know, the rich young ruler comes to Jesus and says, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus says, you know the commandments. Don't commit adultery, don't murder, don't steal, don't give false testimony, honor your father and mother. Isn't it interesting Jesus didn't start with the first commandment? He started in the middle. And the ruler says, I've kept all of these things since I was a boy. So again, he's pointing back to that age of innocence uh, that was in the previous paragraph. He's done everything he thinks he needs to do to have eternal life, evidently. And Jesus looks at him and says, you lack one thing. Go and sell all you got and follow me. And the guy was very rich, and he couldn't do it. 
He couldn't let go of the stuff that gave him status. He couldn't let go of the things that made him high and lifted up. And so he turned and walked away. But the invitation of Jesus was very, very simple. Follow me. That's all he said. Well, he said, sell your stuff and follow me. But we've all got to let go of our stuff in order to follow Jesus. And so that invitation was met by a sad walking away on the part of the rich young ruler. Jesus says to his disciples, it would be easier for the camel to go through the eye of the needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, when I was a boy, I thought, yeah, it would be hard. You know, one of those little needles that takes thread and sews stuff together, that, that's an eye of the needle. And how in the world would a big camel be able to get through a, a little, little needle's eye. Uh, now, if we were on Star Trek, I guess they would be transported through it, and, and so that's overcome, but, but we're really not there. So what, is this such hyperbole that it's totally impossible? That's what the disciples ask. Is this totally impossible? And Jesus said with the human beings, it, it, it is impossible. With God, all things are possible. When I first went to the Holy Land, I heard a story about an entrance into the, uh, the Holy City. And you entered through, uh, through a gate, or actually it was in Bethlehem. You entered through a gate, and, uh, and that gate was about six feet wide, if I remember correctly. And it was only about four feet tall, and it was maybe three, three and a half feet wide. And our guide told us that that door was the eye of the needle. And a camel could get through it, but the only way a camel could get through that would be to take everything off, uh, off its back, and then the camel has to get down on its knees and basically worm its way through that opening, that eye of the needle, and come to the other side. So the imagery there is always stuck with me. Yeah, it's possible to go through the eye of the needle. You just got to take everything off your back. You got to empty your soul. You got to set it aside. And then you got to crawl through. And everybody's got to go the same way. For me, getting through the eye of the needle was pretty tough because I'm pretty tall. And uh, I had to, to, I think I might have been able to walk on really squatted down, but it was a tough way to get through there. And, uh, and when you got out on the other side, if you were an enemy, you stuck your head out first. And, and there was always somebody waiting there during battle to have a sword ready to greet the back of your neck with it. That's why the door was so small. It's hard to get through an eye of a needle. Physically, uh, you got to take everything off. And on the other side of that gate, if it's wartime, somebody was there ready to strike you down. So it's really hard to get through that eye of the needle. And it was really hard for people who want to, <coughs> it's really hard for people who want to hang on to whatever it is we want to hang on to, either the rich young ruler, was it power? Was it money? Was it influence? There may be a lot of stuff he's hanging on to. And it kept him from responding to the invitation of Jesus. And so he went sadly away. At the end of that uh, chapter, there's a, there's a story about a blind beggar who sat outside of Jericho. Mark calls him Bartimaeus. And uh, Bartimaeus was blind. He sat by the side of the road every day and begged. 
for a living. That was that was all he could do was to beg. And when he heard this loud commotion of people coming, he knew something's up. And uh, so he asked, well, who's coming? And, you know, this is time to get your, your basket out for alms and for contributions and all of that. And uh, when he, he hears it's an extraordinary crowd, so he's excited, he's ready to to receive uh, whatever people will give him. Uh, he's, he's crying, well, who's coming? And they say that it was Jesus. And when this guy hears it's Jesus coming, he begins to cry out, Lord Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And he kept crying out and he kept crying out. And it says, those leading the procession, most likely the disciples, scolded him. So here is that word again. Those who were bringing their children to Jesus were scolded. This guy calling out for Jesus is scolded. This is two times in one chapter that that word is used and it's used in a way that it shows that that the people around Jesus, his disciples, church people, were actually working against those who were crying out and seeking to come to Jesus. They were scolding them. One of my favorite seminary professors Dr. Donald Joy had this to say one time. It stuck with me all these years. He said, every Christian is at some level first a Pharisee. I really didn't know what he meant. But over the years, you know how some of those sayings just sort of stick with you. I've looked back on my Christian life and on my journey of faith. And I can point to times and seasons, and, and I never know when I'm in them, so I could be in one of those right now, where it's easier to reduce Christianity to Pharisaism than it is to be a Christian following radically after God. We reduce Christianity to Pharisaism when we have this list of do's and don'ts. We reduce Christianity to Pharisaism when we make a list of our moral guidelines that every good Christian must follow and then exclude the people who don't follow our guidelines. If we roll back Methodist history a hundred years, if you didn't adhere to temperance, uh, the abstinence of alcohol, you weren't a good Methodist Christian. If you played cards or danced or any of that kind of stuff, you weren't a good Christian. That's an example of, uh, of the kind of Pharisaism that we fall into. We do that today when we, uh, when we marginalize groups of people. We uh, do that today when we look in judgment on somebody's lifestyle. We do that today when, when somebody dresses in a way that doesn't seem to measure up or their house isn't nice enough or their car is too nice or on and on and on. We take our morals when we're Pharisees and put them onto a new Christian or another Christian thinking that our job is moral control and quality control of somebody else rather than our job being to keep our eyes on Jesus. Now, it's really easy for Christians to slip into Pharisaism and scold those who are trying to find Jesus because they're not doing it in the way that we prescribed May God have mercy on us when we do that. Bartimaeus kept yelling, 
He kept making a commotion. He kept making a fuss. And Jesus was kind of like that judge, you know, in, in, uh, in last week's sermon. It's like that judge uh, was so aloof and just somebody kept bothering him. And, and Bartimaeus kept bothering Jesus, it appears. But Jesus stops and he says, call him and tell him to come to me. Now that seems kind of inconsiderate of Jesus, doesn't it? How's Bartimaeus going to see where Jesus is? He's blind. <laughs> and Jesus says to the blind man, get up and come over here to me. Oh, why didn't Jesus go to him? You know? And Bartimaeus, you know, he's got, uh, he's, he probably only had his, uh, his robe, <laughs> his little bits of money. That's all he had in contrast to the rich young ruler who had everything. And so Bartimaeus jumps up. He casts off his robe. Uh, he's evidently not worried about being able to find it again. Probably wasn't worth much anyway. And he goes toward the voice of Jesus. Jesus says, what do you want? And Bartimaeus says simply, uh, to receive my sight. And so Jesus heals him. And Jesus says to him, your faith has made you whole. Go your way. Go anywhere you want. And Bartimaeus follows Jesus. Out of these two stories today, and tying it, uh, really three stories, tying this back to that theme verse of those who exalt themselves or those who, uh, who lift themselves up will be brought low and those who make themselves low will be lifted up. We've got two instances where the high and mighty scold the lowly. Really, that's a theme through this whole thing. The high and mighty scold the lowly. And the lowly persist and fight through and ignore that scolding. And they come to Jesus. It's interesting to me that the invitation to follow Jesus that Jesus gave was exactly the same message to the rich young ruler and to Bartimaeus. It was implicit with Bartimaeus, but it was direct with the rich young ruler. Follow me. Follow Jesus. That is what should be our message. The people around us in our communities and in our world need to hear that message but they need to see us as being invitational, not only using words, but in every way. Do we serve? Do we care? Do we show that? If we don't, we run the danger of becoming like those who lift ourselves up we forget what it's like to be somebody struggling, lowly, at the bottom, overlooked, forgotten, that society's failed. But those are the very people that Luke 18 is impressing upon us to reach. May we reach them with the love and the grace of Jesus. But in reaching others, may we remember that we are no better or no worse than those who might be low. We all stand in need of grace, the grace of God, which lifts us up. Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth 
and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Thank you. 